put this in. Well, good morning. It's uh, very close to 11 o'clock, and I'm going to uh, say welcome. It's nice to have you tuning in, and those of you who are with us now, and I know others will be joining us later. Christine would normally be here to do the uh, transition to the service from uh, the moment we, we go live to air, but she's had uh, a very busy morning so far and just needs a moment of poise. So we're going to begin our service uh, by uh, me welcoming you, inviting you to tune into the website to download the uh, weekly leaflet and uh, Christine's uh, Young at Heart talk. Both be available on the church website uh, for today and uh, previous copies are also there if you're interested in catching up uh, on the notes from sermons or for, from Young at Heart. Well, shall we begin uh, our service with a prayer. Let us come before God in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for the privilege of taking time on this morning of Sunday. Uh, we know that it can be viewed any time and any day because it's being recorded. But we thank you that on the first day of the week, the disciples were astonished to discover that the Lord was risen and that this changed not only their lives and their reason for living, but also their calendar and the way they observed their day of rest. So we thank you for the weekly cycle that brings us to the invitation to worship and to dwell upon your goodness toward us. And as we do this, we pray that you will take all the elements of our service, uh, contracted as they are because of COVID, Yet nevertheless, you will take all that we do this morning and use them to bring us closer to yourself. So, Lord, hear us, do us good above and beyond our asking, and accept us as your children in Jesus' name. Amen. Christine is going to bring us young at heart. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm just wanting Graham to check that this is streaming because normally I check it on my iPhone and I couldn't get that we were live. Yeah. Okay, that's that's good. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, so when I get to okay, so just a little bit of um, checking here. Recently, I heard a Professor Tony Blakely speaking. He's a name that's probably not known to people outside Australia, but he's one of the epidemiologists who has advised governments at state and federal levels on managing COVID. I mentioned him to a friend and she said, yes, during the pandemic, we've come to know about all these clever people we didn't even know existed. The same is true of charities. Since the Taliban regained control of Afghanistan, I've become aware of charities I'd never heard of before. And one such charity is called Maboba's Promise. Um, now, Maboba was born in Kabul at 50, 15, she was at the age of 15, she was forced to flee from Soviet authorities and spent two years in a Pakistan refugee camp. Sounds a long time, and it is a long time, but sadly, so many people nowadays spend decades in refugee camps. Maboba married and moved to Australia. She has worked tirelessly to help Afghan refugees, this is her, in Australia by teaching them English and also swimming, because sadly her own son drowned in 1992. In 1998, a doctor in Pakistan asked Maboba to raise money and awareness of the plight of Afghan, Afghan widows and orphans in refugee camps, and she promised that she would. 
And in 2001, the charity Mabuba's Promise was incorporated, and this is the promise. While I live and breathe, I will work tirelessly to protect, heal, and educate the women and children of Afghanistan. Her determination has led to the establishment of hope houses, maternity care, as well as primary and secondary schools for boys and girls. Her organization has made a huge impact in Afghanistan and also built bridges between Australian and Afghan communities. She has close relationships with influential people such as the former governor, Quentin Bryce, and the businessman and philanthropist, Dick Smith. In 2010, she was awarded the Order of Australia model. I heard about this organization for the first time in a news clip from Ta Channel 9. The link to this, this news clip is in the notes of this talk, which you'll find on the website but Graham is now going to play the clip. Sorry, it worked at home, but it hasn't worked just now, so you will, you'll easily find the link. There's, so I'll just tell you what it told us about. This Australian not-for-profit rescued 17 at-risk people from Afghanistan, including 10 orphans. These children were being cared for in orphanages run by Maboba's Promise. Also on the flight were one female staff member and a male staff member and his family. Maboba says these children will now have security and the opportunity to have an education and the orphans may well call her mother. As I learned of this charity, I thanked God that there are so many people doing good, responding to requests for help and opportunities to help as they are presented with them. I'm also aware that for you older people who are still young at heart, it's sometimes hard to know which charities to support. But I believe that God guides us in this. Of course we need to do our homework and investigate whether the values of the charity align with ours. We also need to look into its administration and what proportion of donations goes on administrations, on administration, as this often reflects the efficiency of the charity. Above all, as with all good deeds, I believe we have to open our hearts to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and he will prompt us. Giving to charities is just one of the good works God has already planned for us to do. And maybe some of you young people will even set up your own. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. May we all find how we can help. God bless us. Good morning, everyone. I'm reading from 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 13, to chapter 5, verse 8. Our friends, we want you to know the truth about those who have died, so that you will not be sad, as are those who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will take back with Jesus 
those who have died, believing in him. What we are teaching you now is the Lord's teaching. We who are alive on the day the Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died. There will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So then, encourage one another with these words. There is no need to write to you, friends, about the times and occasions when these things will happen. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come as a thief comes at night. When people say, everything is quiet and safe, then suddenly destruction will hit them. It will come as suddenly as the pains that come upon a woman in labour, and people will not escape. But you, friends, are not in the darkness, and the day should not take you by surprise like a thief. All of you are people who belong to the light, who belong to the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, we should not be sleeping like the others. We should be awake and sober. It is at night when people sleep. It is at night when they get drunk. But we belong to the day and we should be sober. We must wear faith and love as a breastplate and our hope of salvation as a helmet. Amen. Thank you, Amanda. Well, we've been journeying with the Apostle Paul, and uh, if we look at the uh, London Underground map of Roman roads, we discover that uh, he's come from Thessalonica, down south to Dion, Larissa, Athens, Athens, and Corinth. That's the, the route of the journey after leaving uh, Thessalonica. So it's south. Alas, it wasn't simply a matter of getting on the tube and taking a few stops. It's a complicated route. Uh, and it's around the uh, difficult sea. The uh, Aegean Sea is full of islands. You see, those of you who are in Melbourne will know there's an SBS program coming up on Greek islands. And if you've been watching the news over recent years, a lot of Syrian refugees trying to get across this, uh, this particular part of water, mingling with the holiday makers on their, their trips in the days when people could take holidays. So it's a complicated period of time. And there's the route, that this little yellow line that I've added in there, the direction that the Apostle Paul took. Uh, and now he's at Corinth. He's moved on. Uh, next week we'll look at this journey in particular detail. But the reason I've taken you to Corinth is particular. Uh, it's because in Corinth uh, we have, just let me point out to you something about Corinth here. You'll see uh, the, this is the Peloponnese south of Greece and when you look at this enlargement of the map you can see that Corinth located there is in fact on a very narrow neck of land which connects two bodies of water. And in the ancient world this was so significant because it meant that if you pulled your boat across this uh, short distance of water, a kilometre or two, uh, actually I don't know how far it was, but usually if you had a boat you used slaves to pull it across. There was a slipway created. And, and so rather than sail around the whole Peloponnese, people travelled across here. And this made Corinth an international centre for transport. And so it was a very cosmopolitan city. And Corinth had this uh, significant feature of being just at the narrow neck at the Peloponnese. If you go there today, there's a canal that's been cut right through that 
piece of ground. So ships of a reasonable size can actually sail through today. But in the ancient world, they had to pull them over land. And what happened was when Paul had to get out of Thessalonica as quickly as he could, Timothy and Silas went with him, but they remained in Berea, the next stop on the line. We read about that in Acts 17, 14. And then Paul went on and waited for them in Athens. While he's in Athens, there's something to look at and think about, and we, I hope we'll discover that in, uh, next week, what happened in Berea and Athens. And then uh, they didn't catch up with Paul until they got down as far as Corinth. Now, at that point, Timothy advises on what's going on in Thessalonica. Now, they've left it behind, but he's made it down to Thessalonica. Now, it's, it's not a matter of uh, a train trip, as I said. It's, a, it's quite a journey. And Paul stayed in Corinth for a, probably two years. Uh, but while he's in Corinth, he writes a letter to the Thessalonians. Uh, I'm just going to go through that again because I missed the point I wanted to make there. Paul writes his letters to the Thessalonians. So we believe that the two letters to the Thessalonians were written about two years after he left them, but he had heard reports from Timothy and others about what things were going on there. Those of you who are, have been regular at church for a while might recognize this image. I used it on the cover of a leaflet uh, at the start of 2019 when we looked at the Thessalonian letters. And, uh, and I looked at some of, of those letters and I thought, well, I'll just use the same image again. It's a passport and uh, it's, it bears a, a stamp, uh, a stamped envelope. And the theme here is the Lord is coming. The master is coming. I've used the expression master because I've been often using uh, Eugene Peterson's translation, the message, and that's the word he uses. Uh, back then in 2019, <coughs> pardon me, I used an image of... Uh, uh, P65 it is it's, uh, I think it's P65 it's uh, a slide which shows us uh, the oldest fragment we have of the letter to the Thessalonians and it's on parchment and it's in the Museum of Florence uh, it's a long piece of papyrus I said parchment but it's papyrus I believe and this is an enlargement of it I'm not sure that you'll be able to make anything of that on screen but you can see here you can see the Greek letters quite clearly and you can make out the words and with the words and the sequences scholars know that this is the letter to the Thessalonians and it's dated from the third century. So it's quite an old copy. It's uh, P65, if you look up P65, all the ancient papyrus manuscripts we have have the prefix P. All right? Later on they used parchment and you had different annotations to describe the documents from the ancient world. What do we have in this letter? What are we to think about? What has Paul decided that has to be the central idea uh, to this congregation of people whom he loves dearly? If you read the letter, and I encourage you to do that, you'll discover he has deep connection with these people. He loves them dearly. He regards them as family. But there's something that's happened that requires clarification and so he writes to them in 1 Thessalonians with this great theme that the master is coming. And I've listed five things. And again, I, I won't take, uh, I won't take as even amount of time on each of these points, but I just want to, to uh, make them. Firstly, <clears throat> he makes the point that Jesus was raised. This was the message that was so hard for people to swallow. Not just a Jewish message, but the idea that someone who died rose from the dead. And, and today, of course, we encounter the same incredulity with that idea uh, because it is so once only. So the second thing we want to see is uh, what I've, I've called stop all the clocks. That might bring some memories to your mind and I want to talk about, about death itself. And then I want to pick up the point that Paul's making that some believers have died. Well, this hadn't happened to them in their Christian experience. In the three weeks that Paul was with them, maybe a month, none of them died. But now as, as people who have been converted from a pagan world, from the world of the Greek and the Roman gods, to the world where Jesus is Lord, they, what, what happens? How do we do funerals? 
How do we feel about this? The Lord hasn't come back. We were told that he was alive and he would come back, but he hasn't. And so Paul has to tell them they're not disadvantaged, but the date is not in the diary, and he encourages them to build. So let's just take these points first of all. First of all, the incredulity of the resurrection. Now this is a a modern take on Caravaggio's uh, The Incredulity of St. Thomas. You might remember I used that image. Well, here's a modern take on it. A young man with glasses. Perhaps you can't see it very distinctly. I encourage you to look it up on the internet. It's, uh, <clears throat> if you type in the incredulity of St. Thomas, you'll come to, to Caravaggio's image. And this is a modern take on it with the risen Christ letting his wounds be seen by his, his uh, disciples. And so here we, ha- we have a, a group who have believed this. They believe that Christ has died. And they, they are have wondering now, how should they cope if the risen Christ has not come back? What have you to tell us, Paul? Well, we need to pause a moment and think about death. And, and this is not, it's not uh, an easy thing to contend with. It's a challenge to us all. And often we avoid it because it's a difficult and uh, and a complicated question for us. Every weekend in the Good Weekend magazine, the back, there's a person who is asked three questions on the roll of a dice. And one of the questions is about their attitude to it. They roll the dice three times, they get three numbers. If they get a particular number, one of their, they have to ask, answer questions about death. Uh, and so yesterday, Virginia Trioli was asked what did she think about death? What was her take on that and on funerals? It's as up to date as that. But we know that uh, children ask questions about death. You probably remember asking a parent about death. Um, here's, a, here's a nursery rhyme, my grandfather's clock. Perhaps you've heard about that. Many years on the shelf, but it stopped short, never to go again when the old man died. And you might recall uh, W.H. Auden's famous poem. It's called Funeral Blues, and it comes from a play. And in that play, it has a totally different meaning from the way it's presented in the movie that made it famous, which was called Four Weddings and a Funeral. And so we have these words, stop all the clocks, cut off the telephone, prevent the dogs from barking with a juicy bone. Silence the pianos, and with muffled drum, bring out the coffin, let the mourners come. So in that narrative, in that film, you sense there's not really a dry eye in the house because the man's grief has made it seem like the end has come. And indeed, death is an end. So... Let me just think with you for a moment about endings. Because here we're being asked to think about something uh, that you and I haven't experienced. We are still here alive. Of course, we have experienced the death of someone we loved, most likely. And if you're a Christian minister, uh, it will come across your calendar from time to time. Most recently for me, it was yesterday. I was asked to conduct the funeral of a 99-year-old lady. So here, here we are thinking then about death. And what does the Bible have to say about endings? Well, this is, this is a challenge to us all because we, we have to think about how do we deal with endings? Um, one of my favorite songs is by Jackson Brown, and he's an agnostic. And in his song for a dancer... He's trying to describe how he feels at the death of someone he loved. And he wrote this beautiful elegiac song uh, for a dancer. Into a dancer you have grown from a seed somebody else had sown. Go on ahead and dance and sow some seeds of your own. And somewhere between the time you arrive and the time you go may lie a reason you were alive, but you'll never know. How sad a song that is. But that's 
beautifully expressed by Jackson Brown. It's the, it's the feelings of, a, of an agnostic. So and the endings in the Bible uh, are perhaps help us if we can sort them into several categories. First of all, there is an end. And uh, Jesus talks about this in, uh, for example, Mark 13 and the par- parallel passages in uh, Matthew and Luke. Uh, and this is the ap- apocalyptic passage where he t- he's talking about the end for Jerusalem. Jer- the city rejected the Prince of Peace. And he laments this because he sees the city is bent on another kind of revolution, another kind of way forward. They haven't heard him and they don't know the the grief that they're going to uh, embrace in their future and he predicts the end of the city. An end which happened in the year 70 and which another Jew of about the same age as Jesus, Josephus, describes. And Josephus tells us of the horrors of the destruction of Jerusalem. It was a, a cataclysm. And sometimes Christians think that this is a description of the end times. And it does appear that in, uh, in the parallel texts, the uh, end times might indeed be hinted at. It's something of this kind of magnitude that's going to stop people in their tracks. Uh, and, the, the, uh, and the signs uh, may be there. But in particular, the end, the end of all things, is spoken of very clearly in other places. We get it in Acts chapter 1, not verse 1 actually, it's about verse 7 I think, where it says this same Jesus uh, will return as you have seen him go. So we we have the idea there in uh, the writings of Luke, we have it in Colossians and the writing of Paul, we have it in 1 John and we have it in the Gospels where Jesus talks about the Jewish idea that the judge of all the earth will do right and the world will end. There will be an end. There will be the end of this age. Things won't always go on as they have, although we might be persuaded to think that way. And then there's my end for me and for those I love. And this is what the Thessalonians have encountered. And they they don't have a rich tradition of Christian funerals. They're new believers. They've only come to understand about Jesus. And and they're confused. And they feel the same grief. But they don't don't celebrate as they used to in in the the drinking and the grief and the cutting of oneself and so on. How should they be? What should they do? And so Paul is writing to them. Now, there are the, diff, these different endings that we can start to clarify our thinking with. But I wanted to take you to a, a well-known Australian whom I uh, have enormous respect for, and I've learned a little bit about him in the last year, and that is Norman Swan. He's famous as a journalist on the ABC. He he uh, does the health report. He's been very involved, actually, in the structuring of, uh, of certain of the BBC's uh, programs. Uh, and, and he's become re- renowned for his, uh, for his uh, corona cast. Uh, and people have found him a reliable voice throughout this pandemic. And uh, I have an affinity with... Norman Swan, though he doesn't know it, and that is that he and I were both born in Glasgow and we both live in Melbourne. His journey here was different. He wasn't originally a swan. He was originally a Swirsky. But a lot of Polish people got out of Poland in the second, at the start of the uh, Second World War and his parents were among them and they got to Scotland where his father developed a business Now that business folded up and his father couldn't get work until he changed his name to Swan and the week after he got work. He'd been looking for a long time but nobody wanted a Swirsky but the Scots were happy to embrace a Swan. So Norman Swan has had this surname but in in time he migrated to Australia. He did a medical degree at Aberdeen University and, and he's a doctor here. And he's known 
Im massive uh, emotional loss, not just at the family level that his family had to move and that he moved again, but recently, uh, some years back now, on, on a holiday in Italy, his daughter, uh, they hired bikes, and his, his daughter was ahead of him on a bike, and she went downhill through a car park. They weren't going on roads, but it was through a, a car park, and went far too fast and hit a wall and suffered uh, amazing damage and it was amazing she wasn't killed. When he got to the scene the ambulance were already there and she was cared for, she was in hospital for months and according to what I've read she, she made a remarkable recovery but he blames himself for, n for not buying or hiring crash helmets when he hired the bicycles. So you, you can see a father's heart there with this grief uh, that uh, his daughter lost something because of him. But the case I wanted particularly to mention was this one, where on the uh, Facebook page of ABC, it's reported that one of the most challenging questions he had was from a, an eight-year-old boy in Melbourne who asked recently, is everyone in my family going to die? Now, I think this might have been on... Uh, q and I'm not quite sure how it came into him, but I remember hearing about it, and he answered it beautifully. Uh, he has a tenderness in responding to this boy, and he, he said that you know children tended not to, it, it wasn't going to happen, that children don't seem to get this as a real problem, and that even his parents were young enough to manage. He said, but you, you should be careful and thoughtful for your grandparents, because it's affecting older people Worse, This was the situation at that stage. So I thought, here's a man whose various experiences of loss in his life have been challenged and there's a tender response. But one of the extraordinary things I heard him say was, as a Jew who is an atheist, the idea of not existing really scares him. It's a terrifying thought. I heard him say this on, on radio. He was talking about his, his own attitude to death. Um, it is a ter terrifying thing to think that I could be not, become nothing. So there's a, he's quite clearly an atheist. So I've mentioned Jackson Brown with the agnosticism of not knowing. And here's Norman Swan with a uh, commitment to believing at this stage in his life at least that there, there is nothing and it's an awful thing. And here are the Thessalonian Christians. And they're struggling too with this, a similar question. And what Paul has to say to them is, those who have died are not going to miss out on God's purpose and plan. Uh, but we need to ask ourselves, how, how do we think about this? How would you explain color to a blind person, was my question. Would you use music? Would you use the idea that red has got a certain frequency or uh, or would you use texture would you say that yellow is is really quite a sharp texture I, I, how would you do this because you'd be trying to explain something that a person has never known I remember taking uh, uh, a Christian friend to the chapel at the school where I used to work uh, talking to the boarders 160 boarders in chapel and, and at the end boys were asking him questions and one boy said to him so do you only see black? Because he was blind and he had spoken as a blind man to these 160 vital and dynamic young men. And he said, uh, he was asked, do you only see black? And he said, what is black? And the boy had never imagined <laughs> that color has no meaning. So here we are, we're asking about death and beyond and the Bible uses something that we have to resort to. It uses analogy. It uses parables. It uses poetry. It uses apocalyptic drama. All these different genres come together in different places in the New Testament and indeed in the Old to explain the end and also to explain Christ's return. And we don't have time to look into all of these passages. And if you have questions, please send them in, write them to us. Uh, the email address is on the webpage and 
Uh, we'll be happy to look at those things that are, need further exploration. But what the Apostle says is that believers are united to Christ. In a sense, when we become believers in Jesus, we sort of die to ourselves. That's the idea that we've, we've taken up a cross, which, which is a way of saying we, we're on a death walk. We've, we've died with Christ, and our baptism is a symbol of that being one with him. We are buried with him in baptism. We died with Christ. Now Christ will return and he will return to reign on earth. Right? So that the Lord's Prayer, which we pray regularly, your will be done uh, on earth as it is in heaven. That's the prayer that shapes the whole Christian mission. That God is going to return to reign and he's going to do it through Jesus. And the dead who are united to Christ will come with him. Somehow they are held in his care. The Bible doesn't detail this. It just assures us that they are held. And as I was saying earlier today, we're talking here about something, as the Apostle says elsewhere, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So the Bible is at the threshold of language, trying to discuss something that is so wonderful and so powerful. So... We can relax in that. But it's not only that the, the, the fr believing friends who have died are in God's care, but you say, when is this happening? And Paul says, it's not in the diary. The day and the hour, it's like a thief in the night. In fact, uh, just reading those words again reminded me of Bob Dylan's 19, uh, 1979 album. 1979, yes. Um, slow train coming and for the first time I realized why this his first Christian album and here we have another person of Jewish origin but when he became a Christian in 1979 it seemed that everything seemed to make sense to him and three of his albums were explicitly Christian and this one I think the first one seemed to exude a kind of maturity and uh, slow train coming I initially thought it was about Bob Dylan having taken a long time to arrive at a Christian conviction. But I think it may well be, as we see the railway tracks being laid and somebody wielding a pick as if it were, it's actually looking like a cross, as they're laying the tracks for the train to come, that in fact the way we live and the way the message is spreading is preparing the way for the return of Jesus. Certainly, one of the great songs on the album is called When He Returns. I'm going to put the last verse on the screen. I won't play it. I'm frightened if I play it that uh, Facebook will say you don't have the copyright of this song. But I encourage you to look it up. And, and here it is. Surrender your crown on this blood-stained ground. Take off your mask. He sees your deeds. He knows your needs even before you ask. How long... A, can you falsify and deny what is real? How long can you hate yourself for the weakness you conceal? Of every earthly plan that is known to man, he is unconcerned. He's got plans of his own to set up his throne when he returns. So a great song by Bob Dylan reminding us uh, that the timing of Christ's return is not something that's able to be worked out. Although people keep trying uh, again and again to suggest it's nearer now than it was. And I guess you can't argue with that. It's nearer now than it was. But I just want to pick up, a, there's another poem by uh, W.B. Yeats called The, the uh, Second Coming. He wrote it in 1919, just after the First World War. That cataclysm, that kind of destruction of Jerusalem, if you like, where the Western world tore itself apart and millions were killed in the killing fields of Europe. The first of the great killing fields of the 20th century. And, and he, he writes in it about 20 centuries having passed and a great beast arising and loping off to Bethlehem. And the... The, what he's really saying there is that it's 20 centuries, but it's like a watch in the night. 
You see, if we measure time the way we do, uh, as finite creatures, we don't get that kind of different perspective. But the poet can catch it. What have we done with 20 centuries of Christian history and teaching and learning? Has it all gone up in a conflagration? Well, it's ours not to answer these questions, but the Apostle Paul has shared this message because he wants them to be reassured. He's not, he's not uh, writing this letter that Amanda has read the, the extract to us that deals with it. He's not writing this to inform us about speculation regarding the future. He's writing us to help us live now. And his prayer, which comes in a little earlier in chapter 3, says what he, what he, the vision he has for them. May the master pour on the love so it fills your lives and splashes over on everyone around you, just as it does from us to you. May you be infused with strength and purity, filled with confidence in the presence of God, our Father, when our Master Jesus arrives with all his followers. May God help us to be filled with that confidence, with that strength, with that purity of the love of God being shared among us as we seek to prepare ourselves for that day when we shall go to him or he will come to us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that this prayer of St. Paul would reach into our community and that lives will be changed. We want to pray for all who experience loss, bewilderment, mourning and grief because of the death of someone they've loved. We know that it's a difficult time through COVID and we pray that you will make us compassionate people. And we ask Heavenly Father that you will bless this meditation, this ancient meditation on the Apostles' writing to us today as we think about it and reflect during the music. Amen. I've been playing a lot of Bach and Telemann. Telemann was actually the godfather of one of Bach's 20 children, 10 by his first wife, who died, and then he had 10 more with his second wife. That's Bach. Uh, Telemann was one of the most prolific composers of all time. But today, I'm going to play a the first movement of a solo viola suite by Max Rager. Johann Baptist Joseph Maximilian Reger, a German composer of the late um, 1800s. He died in 1914 and he wrote this in the last year of his life. But um, he was a Catholic married to a Protestant and I just wanted to... I've got the wrong glasses on, but... Um, uh, he helped to push German music into the 20th century, but he also helped to maintain an earlier German religious heritage by placing the melodies of Protestant hymns into his works. Rager's mindfulness of the importance of a spiritual base and reality was his way of helping his performers and listeners to prepare for life in a spiritual world.
Well, thank you, Amanda. Thank you for the introduction to Max Rager as well, whose full names I'll have to be reminded of. Shall we join together now in prayer? Let us bring our thoughts to God. Almighty God, as we bow before you today, we give thanks for the life and ministry of Jesus, your servant. Thank you for the glimpses he has given us of the kind of new world that you have in mind. We greatly rejoice that by his life, death and resurrection, Jesus has already brought into view a world of justice, mercy and love. We can scarcely imagine what it will be like when he comes to reign, when he replaces wrong with right, when every tear is gone and the earth is filled with the knowledge of the Lord as surely as the waters cover the sea. Thank you that in the face of our human mortality and our current experiences of disability, loss, and death, you invite us not to grieve without hope, but to know that the judge of all the earth will do right. We are very conscious of the terrible impact of the pandemic on the poorer nations of the world, nations without any credit rating, enduring crop failure, with internal conflict, hungry children, and military or manipulative leadership. In your mercy, Lord, speed the coming of another king, even Jesus. Until that day dawns, please enable your disciples to work effectively to feed the hungry, heal the sick, welcome the stranger, and share the good news of the Messiah who will come to reign. Thank you for the news of Maboba's promise. We pray for the women and children of Afghanistan and ask your blessing on the orphans rescued by her work. We pray for the starving children in Tigray and ask that the United Nations aid will reach the famished. We pray for nations overloaded with refugees, thinking especially of Lebanon and Turkey. In this week of the Presbyterian Church's General Assembly, we pray that you would restore your church, O oh Lord. Be present among us by your spirit and mold us to your will. As the incidence of the COVID Delta variant rises, help us by compliance with the medical advice not to put others at risk and to encourage all to get vaccinated. As a new term of mixed cl in class and on school, on screen school resumes, Provide help to every stressed home, student and teacher. We thank you that in Australia politicians can be held accountable. We thank you for Gladys Berejiklian's commitment to the well-being of the people of New South Wales and pray for whom, her successor. We pray for all who struggle emotionally with lockdown, young and old, experiencing imposed isolation people working from home while managing small and school-aged children, those predisposed to anxiety, business people fearing and some experiencing financial collapse. Keep us kind in our thinking and communicative with our neighbours. Lord, the whole creation groans with longing for your redemption. We see some of the injustices, yet are blind to others. Open our eyes, help us to see and to, support, and to support the causes which best align with your purposes. Come quickly, we are weary of the world's brokenness. We remember frail elderly and sick friends this morning. Bring encouragement and hope to them now as we commit them to you in the silence. As we think of them, we ask that they would come to you and cast their cares upon you. Know that you care for them. We ask them in the name of the one who taught us all to pray and say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Came across my desk yesterday that uh, at a concert in Wembley Stadium, um, to mark the, the uh, passing of Freddie Mercury. Uh, David Bowie said he wanted to remember uh, those who were dying of the pandemic that was AIDS in those days. And he got on his knees in front of 72,000 people and prayed the prayer we've just prayed together. It's quite extraordinary to hear 72,000 people slowly settle to listen to what he was saying and uh, it took us all by surprise. May God bless you this week with uh, beautiful surprises and may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with each one of us and with those whom we love now and always. Amen. <laughs>